Happy Sunday. Happy Sunday. That was weak. Okay, let's pretend for a second, right? That somebody in this room had a team still that they were cheering for, right? Left of the game, right? Now, Dustin, I'm proud of you, you know, even in, even in utter defeat, right? You're still a, a Syracuse fan. I've seen a, a few more UK fans here this morning, but I don't think any Villanova or UNC, is it UNC, North Carolina, same thing? Or whatever, North Carolina, right? I think that's who's left, right? No one really cares about them, right? So, you, it's, you know, there's nothing really to cheer about, right? But that last song we just sang, right? Jailbreak, it's called, right? Set free. I mean, there is a truth in that that is worthy of shouting and rejoicing in that we have been brought from death to life. We were once losers, and now we are victorious in Christ. We were once defeated, and now we're more than conquerors. We were once under God's wrath. Well deserved. Earned. But God, He loved us so much, He died for us. Wonderful thing. Now, Dale, Dale looked the sound booth and put the spot there. You know that video I wanted to show at the end? Did you find it or no? Can I show it at the beginning, or that just throw us all off? Okay, let me intro a video here. Uh, we meant to show this Caleb like two weeks ago. Y'all know I got like a little ADD in the brain where I just go every which direction and forget things. This was like a pre-Easter video, like to, to encourage us to invite friends and family with us to Easter services. Uh, but the funny thing is the video actually takes place like after the Easter service, okay? So better late than never, here's a good video to set us up for thinking about God's truth and how it impacts us. Verse 28 through 30, we're going to see this good news. 
Now, here's what's tricky about this passage, right? This passage is the good news, but it's the good news with really big words. Now, if you've been in church your whole life, you've heard some of these words, right? Calling, election, predestination, foreknown, glorification, sanctification. There's these words we sling around if you're in church. But I think a lot of times we sling these words around without really understanding them. So this morning, the intent is not to get dorky. The intent is to get more in love with what he has done. It should overwhelm us. Overwhelm us. So if you can turn with me to Romans 8, it's in your handout if you want to follow along parts of that verse uh, underneath every heading. And we're going to read just three verses from Romans 8, verse 28 to 30. If you can stand with me in honor of reading God's word to us. Romans 8, verse 28 through 30. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to His purpose. For those whom He foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Let's pray. God, we just heard some big words. <laughs> And I know even in my own heart, Lord, even if I mentally understand these truths, I think in my heart, Lord, I haven't fully understood and embraced this. I don't know if I ever will, but God, this morning I ask for myself, I ask for all of us, Lord, deepen us in your love. Fill us with the knowledge of you and what you have accomplished on Easter Sunday for eternity for those who love you. For those whom you've called. God, this morning, Lord, let us be so overwhelmed and overflowing with your love that we can't help but want to be prepared to give an answer to those, Lord, who are without a hope, to give them the reason for the hope that lies within us that they see in our life and in our lips, in our minds, in our spirits, in our hearts, Lord. That we are overwhelmingly enjoying you, looking forward to you, longing for you, desiring you to come back for us. Oh Lord, that we might be set free for an eternity from the bondage of sin and flesh. It's all this we cry out in your holy name, Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, Taylor, you sat on the front row, and you're wearing, well, you're wearing a root kind of, as a UK shirt for a second. Can I pick on you? Okay, if you had said no, I still would have done it. Anything else? So, Taylor, I haven't seen you for a couple weeks now, two weeks, okay? I was going to guess a month, I wasn't sure, but a couple weeks. So let's just pretend, you know, Taylor, in the last two weeks, something huge has happened in his life. In fact, I say, hey, Taylor, uh, what happened these last two weeks? And he, and he tells me, well, I mean, I got in this, like, crazy car accident, flipped over uh, in, in a pond, and I was dead. But now I'm alive. I'm here today. And I, I said, Taylor, I didn't know this about you. I didn't know that in the last two weeks all this had happened. And I said, Taylor, how did it happen? I mean, how did you go from death to life? And he just kind of shrugged his shoulders. I don't know. Just, I mean, I'm here, right? I mean, I'm alive. But it was almost this kind of reaction in response of, like, I mean, it's in the past. I mean, it's history. It doesn't really matter right now, right? I don't know. I mean, if, if that was the response we heard from Taylor, wouldn't we be like, I mean, come on, Taylor, seriously, tell me the details. What happened? How, how did you get in that wreck to begin with? Right? How did you crash your car? What do you remember? Was there anybody around you who witnessed it? 
What about the first responders? Who was the first one there? How did they, how did they get you out of an upside down car in a lake without you being permanently damaged or dead? Who, who brought you back to life? I mean, was it CPR? It wasn't those little shocky paddle things? I mean, what happened? What about the EMTs who took you to, to the hospital? I mean, how long did it take for you to become alive? Once you became alive, I mean, what came out of your lips? What was going on in your mind? What happened? What about the doctors and nurses that treated you at the ER? What about the surgeons? What about therapy? Tell me about these things. I mean, how has this changed you? You were dead and now you're alive. What happened? How did it happen and now what? How does this affect you now? We would want detail, right? And we would hope if we were Taylor, right, we would want the details. Because we would recognize something significant happened. And I didn't deserve it. And in fact, if I can, I'm going to go back and say thank you, right? I'm going to find those who brought me life, who helped me come back to life, right? And I'm going to live in appreciation. Maybe this was a wake-up call not to take life for granted, brothers and sisters. Guys and gals, is this not the exact same thing in salvation? There should be part of us that don't just say and sit passively saying, yeah, I'm alive. I'm a Christian. I'm going to heaven, right? It's in the past. No big deal. It is a big deal. And we want to know the details mm -hmm. because we want to praise our God and we want to live for Him. I mean, if He died for us, should we not? Why wouldn't we want to, long to, live for Him? We belong to Him. It's life changing forever. It's not some sort of passive, unemotional event. Maybe. Maybe just maybe you were saved a long time ago. Genuinely saved by God. But that joy of your salvation seems distant. Right? I mean, like if Taylor was brought from death to life like that, maybe for a few weeks, maybe the newspaper did a write-up, maybe there was an interview on a, on a TV show, maybe he shared with everybody he knew, but after a while, he started to take it for granted. He started to take it for granted. Isn't that us? That there's a temptation in us with salvation to, to take Jesus for granted, to take life for granted. This is why God gives us those three verses we read. Those three verses we read. And we need to first of all realize, right, that this is a message first and foremost and only for God lovers. For God lovers. If you're following along with me in our bulletin, this is a message for God lovers. Now what does that mean? Well, here's the question. Do you love God? Do, do, not, not just love the idea of God, not just like God, not just come to God when it's convenient. Do you love Him? Do you treasure Him? Do you value Him? Do you desire Him? Has He changed your life? Right? No, no, Whitley, you're a front rower too this morning. No one's ever going to sit on the front row after this. Look, that's why that's all over here. Okay, y'all are the praise. Whitley, there's something in your gut this morning. I can't exactly see it. Right? But I can, there's signs and symptoms there. There is something within you. What is it? A baby. It's a who? Nora. Is it Grace? Nora Grace? Nora Grace is due this week. Right? Right? Saturday, Friday, somewhere in there. Right? So let's assume that before next Sunday, Nora Grace is here. Right? Lord willing, she's coming this week. What's between now and then? Earth. A lot of ouchies, right? Yeah. Right? A little tip failed. I learned this way the hard, hard way, right? And they put all the little doodads on her gut, right? To see the contraction things. And you can kind of like tell ahead, right? There's a little supper in her head, right? Don't call the shop, okay? Right? <laughs> Up here it comes. Ooh, this is going to be a big one, right? It's a 7.0 on the Richter scale, right? You're going to feel it. You're not going to forget this one, right? Don't do that, okay? <laughs> Don't do that, right? Now between now and Nora's arrival, let's be honest, there's going to be a lot of pain. 
and discomfort. But what? What gets you through the childbirth pain? The child, the life, the joy, the future, the hope. And brothers and sisters, if you are a God lover, guess what? Before he comes back to us, or before we go to him, there's a lot of hurt that's going to happen. I mean, we just read this in Romans 8, 22 to 24. That's the comparison, both for the world and in us. Like childbirth, there's a lot of pain and suffering, but there's hope. If we love God, it's not just only past tense, we enjoy and love is appearing. But it's also indicated, right? If you love God, you're looking forward to Him coming back. You're looking forward to being with Him. So what? Are you a God lover? Now, there's a big fancy word in there on your bulletin. The word is regeneration. Regeneration. So in simple terms here, how it's explained, right? This, these quotes here from a guy named Wayne Grudem, by the way. You ever, I ever had to recommend one book apart from the Bible again? Now this is a little intimidating, all right? A lot intimidating. This is like the Cliff Notes version by his son, okay? Christian belief, systematic theology, right? But man, it's awesome. What systematic theology is, right? Is what does the whole Bible say about a topic, right? So you want to know what does the whole Bible say about heaven? What does the whole Bible say about angels? What does the whole Bible say about something? Any topic, you look it up and it's in there. It's just such a wonderful thing. So in the back, right, there's a little dictionary, basically, right? A dictionary of Christianese, of Bible words, right? Bible words, theology words. But the beauty of it is it helps us see how amazing He is, right? You're not going to read that all in one sitting, right? But what's cool is kind of like a study Bible. A study Bible is so great because when you hit that stick, you get stuck. What does this mean? It says, I don't know, and just moving on, right? To know God's showing me. God show me the details, and He's given His teachers and helpers to do that. Okay? So what does this all mean? This all means that His love in us is amazing. That's why we have the truth. We talked about it last Sunday in verse 28. For those who love Him, for those who love God, all things work together for good. All the pain that Whitley's about to endure this week, right, is working together for the good of life, for the good of North. And brothers and sisters, if you love God, this is true. All the pain, all the suffering, all the success, all the good times, work together for the good of seeing the Lord's hand work. How does it all happen? How does it all happen? It happens by God. Is God calls us and God purposes us. God calls us and God purposes us. Verse 28 continues, it says, For those who are called according to His purpose. For those who are called according to His purpose. Now there's two sides of this call. There's an outward call and there's an inward call. Outward call, inward call. And they work together. God uses them Together. So, for instance, right, let's pretend uh, like another front row. I haven't gotten you yet. Okay, like Brandon, right? Brandon falls asleep. When you're asleep right? Brandon's asleep, right? Typical Sunday morning, right? His pastor keeps going on. Brandon. Brandon. Now, outwardly, I'm calling him, right? Inwardly, he ain't hearing me, right? He's still drooling over here, right? But suddenly, I call in a way that he can't even ignore it. Brandon, wake up. And, and suddenly, right, there is an inward reaction. You may not understand how it all works between the ears and the mind and the eyes and the heart. But something happens. Something happens that wakes him up. And brothers and sisters, I don't know how exactly in every single deal the detail that our God wakes us up, but He does. I believe He calls us. Maybe it was a pastor, a sermon. Maybe it was a friend, a family member. Maybe it was a, a, a Bible study, right? And somehow you heard God calling you by name, wake up. Confess your sin. Turn from your sin. Trust in me. 
believe that I love you so much I died on the cross and rose from the grave. There is an outward call that transforms you inside, and it's all about God, right? It's all about God. How does a dead person save themselves? Peter was really in an upside-down vehicle in a pond. How would he save himself if he's already dead? The answer is he can't. He can't save himself. He can't even cry out for help if he's dead. Brothers and sisters, we were spiritually dead. No hope in ourselves. We needed the outward call of God that in a secret way, impossible, humanly speaking, for us fully to understand mysterious, but yet revealed, He breathes life into us. I mean, think about that. How did God make Adam and Eve? Adam, dirt, breathes life. Eve, a rib, right? How? I don't know, but He does. Because he is the same God that with the word could create the stars and the galaxies and the planets and the universe. And brothers and sisters, he calls us and he purposes us effectively. Now you'll see some links in here. Here's the whole point. These three verses that we're looking at this morning are so full, so full of God's truth. We can't do it justice on a Sunday morning. I looked up as I was preparing. Uh, there's a passage from I've heard of John Piper. Just on these three verses, you want to guess how many sermons he's preached on these three verses alone? Like 16 or 17. Just on three verses. Why? How? Because it's so, so amazing. Now listen, my girls, <coughs> uh, uh, I got some of their toys up here this morning, right? Now, Scott Aiken may dance in front of you, but I don't do tiaras on stage. I'm not aware of that. Now, from a distance, you see these, right? Now, you see they're sparkly, right? From a distance, you can tell there's something unique and special, right? It looks like a crown. Remember last week, you looked at Jesus' crown. These are beautiful. Maybe you've gone to a museum before. You've gone to a museum where they have like a jewelry display and... What you do is at a distance, you can tell they're sparkly, right? Now, these things are just probably like CZ, right? Like little fakies, right? But if they were real diamonds, how much would they be worth? Priceless. These were real diamonds, flawless diamonds, perfect, humanly speaking, diamonds. These things would be priceless. And at a distance, you can ooh and ah at the most guys, or whatever, right? Too expensive, not worth it, right? The girls would be like, hey, let me see, right? Like if someone gets engaged, you might want to look at their ring. But you don't just look at their ring from a distance. You don't just pick up binoculars, what do you do? You draw close, right? And as you draw close, you can see the setting, the jewels. If you're in a museum, right, and there's a rare gem, or like I went to the Tower of London once in England, and they've got the crown jewels there, and you draw close to it, and, and there's like maybe like a placard or a display, and it explains, like, there's significant stones in here. Here's where this stone is from. Here's why it's so special, right? Here's its characteristics and details. Here's how much it's worth, right? And those details matter, brothers and sisters. Right now, what we're doing is these three verses. We're drawing in to a priceless gem. God's love. That's what we're looking into. God's love. How much He loved you. What it means that He loved you. It's not some shallow human use of the word love. This is deep and this is beautiful. But we will not behold the beauty as He intends if we don't draw close. So we go close these truths. When did this all happen? I and mean, when, when did God think of this whole thing before creation? You were known, known, foreknown before creation. It's not just he knew the facts about you, right? He knew where you were born, he knew where your parents would be. It's not some sort of just facts, like he collected your 
statistics. No, he knew you personally. It's a relational note. Isn't that amazing to think about? Before he spoke the universe, he knew and cared about your name. He has purpose for you. You, my friends, are known before creation. And you're known by a sovereign God. What does that mean? It means all power. All power. He is omnipotent. He has all power. He is omnibenevolent. He is all good. He is omniscient. He is all knowing. He is omnipresent. He is everywhere. He wants to be at all times. Man, our God is so big. And he wants us to witness his sovereignty and his knowledge that he had a plan relationally, eternally. Eternal. You get this from before creation to the end of time. For eternity future, he knows you and wants you and desires you. It's incredible. Brothers and sisters in Christ, what has he done? He has predestined us. He has predestined us. It's another term for election. See these words in the scripture? And basically, election and predestination is an act of God before creation in which He chooses, He chooses some people to be saved. Not because you had some merit in you, not because you were good enough or smart enough or wise enough or born in the right place. He chooses. Why? Only because of his sovereign, good pleasure. Now, no, no analogy is perfect, but uh, as I was preparing this, I was thinking, you know, elementary school, think about elementary school, right? We would go out to the playground, we had a black top, we'd go out to, we'd play games. Sometimes it was basketball, sometimes it was a game we called 500, where we tossed like a tennis ball in the air, and we would pick teams. Sometimes we would pick teams. You remember being in a situation where there's someone choosing? And the question is, am I going to get chosen or not, right? Now, that person choosing, right, is making a decision based on merit, right? Who is going to give value to me? Who is going to help my team win? That's, that's why this analogy is not perfect, okay? But think of it from your perspective, waiting in a crowd. I wonder, am I chosen? And suddenly, you hear your name. Now, what goes through you at that moment when you hear your name called, when you know you've been chosen? There should be part of you that's like, well, why me? Unless you're kind of prideful and arrogant. And then you're like, I mean, I should have got picked five people ago. Took you long enough to figure it out, right? But have you ever been chosen, maybe, before somebody else? And, and you're kind of like, well, why did you pick me? Why did she pick me? I didn't deserve to get called yet. I didn't earn it. But even in that moment of uncertainty, there's joy. Yes, I'm wanted. I'm loved. I'm desired. I'm chosen. And have you ever gotten on the team and maybe one of your buddies is left behind? One of your buddies is over there. And you kind of whisper to the, you know, the captain, the one that says, hey, pick my buddy. Pick Bob, right? Grab Susie, right? Pick them. I love them. I care for them, right? You want them with you. You want them chosen, right? Now, again, this analogy is not perfect, but do you get the joy of your salvation? If you're in Christ, there should be part of you that says, why me? I didn't deserve it. I didn't earn it. I'm flawed. I'm sinful. I deserve God's wrath. But we rejoice and we praise Him for His sovereign choice. See, if you fast forward to Romans 9 and 10, you see Paul gets to the other side. He sees, even as he's saved, he sees friends and family, Jewish friends. He wants them saved. God, if I can lay down my life for them, I would. But he knows it doesn't work that way. So what does he do? He pleads to God and he goes for God. He knows those Jewish friends and family have no hope without hearing the name of Christ. 
Now, it's, this issue of predestination and election is easy to get mixed up in. A lot of people get to be fights over this. And well, well, if God chooses some, doesn't that mean he's passing over others? So does that mean God's just throwing others into hell? What kind of God sends people to hell? Some tough truths. We're laying a foundation this morning for what's ahead as we go into Romans 9. But here's the beauty. Our God is not willing that any should perish. He desires for everybody to have eternal life. But for those who have not been chosen, it's their own doing. Simultaneous to His choosing is the reality of their own doing. They have turned their back to God. They don't care about Jesus. They don't care about God. They've chosen themselves. They sinned against God on high. So they end up in hell. For those who are without Christ, they do end up in hell. It's their choice. They've chosen it. It's part It's part That's why we rejoice, Christians, if you've been chosen, you hear this word, predestination, election, we cry out, why me, God? But thank you, God. And simultaneously, we go out and we plead with the lost, come and die with the king. He loves you. He died for you. Listen to him. Repent and turn. Humble yourself in front of God that you might have life. Why? Why does God save us? Why does he save us? Verse 29, to be conformed to the image of his son. He saves us to look like Jesus. To look like Jesus. To be so close to Jesus, we witness His beauty personally, and He changes us in a way that shines out the sea, right? There's something in Him that doesn't make sense, right? How did this happen? It happened to Jesus. And the whole purpose is not to pat ourselves on the back, it's to point the world through us to Jesus. What about the second part? Kind of threw me off a little bit. In order that he might be firstborn among many brothers. What does that mean? What, what, what does salvation have to do with Jesus being firstborn among many brothers? Well, here's what it means. If you were born back in the day and you were the firstborn male, you were preeminent. Right? You were high ranking. You were the man in terms of the family relationship. And Jesus desires that we're conforming in His image that He might be preeminent, not just in our life, but among many Christians, among us, lifted up, high and lifted up, exalted, glorified, preeminent, not just in our words, but in our lives. That is our purpose, to be more and more free from sin and to be more and more like Christ. To be holy as He is holy. That the world sees and beholds who He is. And that those who love Him, the brethren in Christ, the family of Christ, we lift Him up. Who? We need to stop here for a second and remember, who is He talking to? Who is He talking to? Because at this moment, we might be tempted to get a big head. Right? To start thinking, you know, well, I got it together. I'm going to heaven. Look at me, I got my act together. And then God reminds us, no, no, all that sin in the world, all the craziness that's going on around us, such were some of you. Brothers and sisters, we are sinners that are called and saved by grace. We are now saints who struggle with sin, who keep falling back into sin, but without Christ, our identity eternally is in our sin. But God called us. He saved us by His grace. What does that word mean? Grace is but a gift. We've inherited a corrupt nature. We have freely chosen. We have freely willed to do life on our own. We have chosen sin. We have chosen Rebellion against God. Don't start to think for a second that God saves us as if He needs us. It's not like He's bored in heaven. 
and waiting for the party to start when we arrive, right? The party has already started from eternity present and it continues for eternity future. He does not need us. Oh, but he loves us. So he includes us. He brings us in to feast with him forever. But in order to do that, in order to do that, to bring us in, to take us from being sinners to saints, he has to make a declaration, right? He has to make a statement as power. So he declared what? He declared what? He declares us justified. Justified. Now we tend to think of this from our perspective, right? When we think about salvation, we default to thinking of it, right, from my perspective, right? I was saved. I am saved. I was baptized. I belong to such and such church. I am a Christian. We're default, when we talk about our relationship with God, we default to thinking of it from our perspective. God wants to twist that upside down in this passage. This, in this passage, He's showing us from His perspective. Let me show you what happened. You didn't understand this. You'll never fully understand this. But I want to show you. Here's what happened. I justified I declared you legally guilt-free. That's why Romans 8 starts out with verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Why? Why? How? How is there no condemnation and no guilt on us anymore? He took it. He declared us guilt-free. And not only that, He declares us righteous. He takes all His righteousness and He puts it on us. Oh, it's amazing. He's adopted us. We don't belong naturally to His family. He brings us in. He adopts us, right? So that His crown, you get this? His kingly crown of suffering becomes our identification. It's his crown of righteousness on our head, right? Only little princesses wear crowns, right? Or princes. What, what is the identity of a prince or a princess? Their identity is in their king. Their identity is in their royal blood. Brothers and sisters, if you are in Christ, you have been adopted into royalty. And you belong to him forever. He has declared you guilt-free. He has declared you righteous. It's beautiful. John MacArthur says it this way. You've been made right with God by God. Been made right with God by God. I love how this finishes in verse 30. There's this sequence of events that's happening. You ever put dominoes down? If domino A goes down, domino B goes down. Domino B goes down, domino C goes down. From beginning to end. And that is the truth here. That is the truth. That, that for those who love God, they've been called and purposed by God. Domino goes down. He foreknew you. Domino goes down. He predestined you. Domino goes down. To be conformed to His image. Domino goes down. Those whom He predestined, He called. Domino goes down. And those He called, He justified. Domino goes down. And those, brothers and sisters, if He has justified you, He has glorified you. Oh, this is good news. Here's what's really cool about this. Glorification is a future event. It's a future reality. When God comes back, for those who are in Christ, if you're already dead, He raises you to life, and He brings you fully, completely with Him for eternity. He brings the saints back spiritually, brings their bodies to life spiritually, unites them together, takes those who are in Christ that are still alive with Him, and we all go with Him for a full reality of glorification. What about verse 30? It's referred to the past tense. He glorified already. What does that mean? It's a done deal. It's a done deal. It is secured. In fact, next week, Next week, we're going to bite off the tongue of the glory of suffering. Once saved, always saved. What does that mean? What does that mean correctly? Oh, there is hope in that 
truth behind that, that those who are in Christ can never be separated from His love. But the deeper question is this, what does it mean to be in Christ? Next week, once saved, always saved. Oh, some glorious truths but that need to be considered in the light of Scripture. If you're in Christ, you have a future, right? A uh, hope. It's not fully seen. It's, it's, it's giving birth, right? It's not fully experienced yet, but it is a guaranteed thing, secured to His name by His name, united with Christ for an eternity. So what? I mean, this is some deep stuff here, right? The temptation is to take all these words and just accumulate knowledge. No, these truths, these words, the meaning behind them are designed by God to transform us four ways we think. One, confirm your salvation. Confirm your salvation. In fact, in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10, God tells us, be diligent. This, this is a calling you have. This is a responsibility. You're in a year listening right now. God is saying to you, be diligent, make effort and work to confirm your calling and election. What does that mean? You don't call yourself, you don't elect yourself to salvation, but you have a responsibility to be dil diligent to confirm, are you truly saved? See, in verse 5 through 7 of 2 Peter 1, there's this sequence of things that happen that if someone's in Christ, there is faith. That's the human response that even God gives us because He's the author and He's the perfecter. He's the one who finishes your faith. He's the one who completes it and He's the one who gives it to you. But faith produces virtue. Virtue is connected with knowledge. Knowledge is connected with self-control. Self-control is connected with steadfastness. Instead, that fastness is connected with godliness. Godliness is connected with brotherly affection, which is connected with love. Do you see that? Do you see that in your life? If God has saved you, it will show up. And the beauty of it, the beauty of it is God has richly provided for those who are saved an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The door is wide open. Huh. He is waiting for us. Second, not only to confirm our salvation, but to share our salvation. You have a story to tell. <coughs> Taylor, he had legitimately been brought from death to life this past week. He blew off the interview opportunities. Turn the reporters away. He didn't even write a thank you note to the doctor. You know, he just forgets you guys. I don't want to talk about it. Dude, you ingrate, right? You're ungrateful over something significant. You're in Christ. You're in Christ. Don't be an ingrate. Don't be ungrateful to God. Be grateful. Share His love. Share the story of His salvation. Know the details. Look at the depth of the beauty, right? Draw close to these truths and behold how priceless His love is. He paid the price that you cannot pay for the beautiful love He has given us for an eternity. So draw close. And when you draw close to you will share it, you will show it, you will speak it, and you will always be prepared to make a defense for the hope that's within you. Because there's people around us. We don't understand all the details, but their back is turned against God right now. So we cry out to God. There's two things we do. God, save them. We plead to God, have mercy on them. God, rescue them. And then we go to them and we plead with them. Look at my God. Hear about my God. He loves you. He died for you. He desires you for an eternity. He is providing a way of salvation. Follow Him. Oh, we plead with God and we plead with man. 
we share our salvation. We live it out. We live it out. We have a new lease on life because everything we had before wasn't truly life. We were dead in our sin. Spiritually, no hope. Spiritually, nothing good. But He saved us. He brings life into us. And we get such a big view of God that all the pain and suffering that is ahead of us, just birth pains, just birth pains, it hurts, it's significant. Oh, but the joy of what's ahead. We keep our eyes focused on Jesus and everything else fades away. We live a life that points others to God's salvation. We stay focused in our thoughts, in our feelings, in our spirit, in our lives, in our lips. And we rejoice. We rejoice. I want to read this. It's significant. Isaiah chapter 25. You can turn with me in your Bible. Isaiah chapter 25. We're going to close with this. This is how we rejoice in our salvation. This is how we hold the beautiful gems of salvation in our hands. This is how we know what we're going to hear next week in verse 31. That if God is for us, who can be against us? Isaiah 25, beginning in verse 6. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined, and he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all the nations. He will swallow up death forever. The Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces and the reproach of His people He will take away from all the earth for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Behold this is our God. We have waited for Him that He might save us. This is our God. This is the Lord. We have waited for Him. Let us be glad and rejoice in His salvation. God, too often we have taken you for granted. We have been in grace. We have been ungrateful to you, Lord. We've lost the joy of our salvation. We have left our first love. And this is serious. God, for those of us who are in Christ this morning, I pray this morning you confirm to them in their lives that they have gone from death to life. They have been saved by you. And that beyond that, Lord, they live in that joy. They rejoice in you. And they share and overflow your beauty, your life, your hope, the details of what you have done and what you are doing in them for eternity. God, for those in this room right now, I know, Lord, I know and I grieve there are some here this morning that if they die today, Lord, They would be separate from you for an eternity in hell. God, I plead with you, Lord, we plead with you, Lord, open their eyes, open their ears, breathe life and then help them be here in their spirit this morning, the external call of you by name. Say, I've chosen you, I've loved you, I've called you, I've died for you. It got in them, in them this morning, Lord. Breathe them. Bring them into salvation. Help them to turn from sin and to trust in you, to treasure you, to love you forever for an eternity. You are good. You are the God of our salvation. You really rejoice, and it's to you now to see.